Welcome. In this video, I'm going to give a brief explanation of domain and range, as well as introduce interval notation. So let's start with a brief description, a simple definition for what a function is. Um, a function is a rule for assigning to each element in a set D, which we call the domain, exactly one element in a set E, which we call the range. Now, if you wanted to look at that kind of visually, you can imagine that we've got this collection of values over here. Um, this would be the set of numbers D, which is called the domain. And from there, we're going to pick some element out of that. Uh, let's say we call that X. Now, X we take that number and we put it into our function. And our function is some sort of machine. Sort of like a little black box here that will take that and do some sort of operations on it. So this is our function. Now oftentimes you'll have a function named f, but you can really name it anything you like. Now out comes from this machine a new value which is denoted f of x. And that is in a collection of numbers that could come out of this machine. That collection e is called the range. Now, what we're looking at a lot with, um, with calculus here is when you have a function given to you, well, we want to maybe look at what kinds of values you can put into this function where it still has a meaningful output, where it's still defined. So, to find the domain of the function, what I like to do is I, um, I like to think about all of the possible numbers I could start with. So, we start with all numbers, with all real numbers. And in all real numbers, we can denote that with R with a, a double vertical bar like that. Now what does the real numbers include? Well, it includes integers. Integers are all of the numbers that you think of as whole numbers, but including negatives. Real numbers also include the rational numbers. You can think of these as decimals and fractions, um, terminating decimals or repeating decimals, or something that can be expressed as a fraction three quarters or you know five halves 2.23 etc it also includes the radical numbers radicals or roots root 2 for instance or cube root of 5 it includes all kinds of other mathematical constants now mathematical constants you may be familiar with some like pi We'll be talking about another mathematical constant, E, quite often in calculus as well. Okay, now you've got an idea of all of the potential numbers that might be able to be included in the domain. A lot of times it's actually more important to think about what numbers must be excluded because they wouldn't provide a meaningful output. They would not be defined. So we're going to exclude values from the real numbers where the expressions, the result is not defined. Now you can start to think about, well, what kind of operations would result in something undefined? You can even just take a look at your calculator and see what kind of things you could do on there so that you'd end up with an error on your screen. Now, classic example would be dividing by zero. If you have a fraction with a zero denominator, that is undefined. So there may be a few different values belonging to the real numbers that couldn't be in the domain because it would result in a zero denominator. You may be also familiar with taking square root of negative numbers. Um, and that works, that's the same problem with any even powered root. So you could also think, well, if you have a root in there that's an even powered root, square root, fourth root and whatnot, if uh, the radicand, the stuff inside the radical, is negative. If that's the case, 
then you may end up having numbers that you couldn't include in your domain. Um, now we'll also see with logarithms a lot of problems as well. Logarithms can only take positive numbers. So logarithms of zero or negatives would not be defined. Okay, and then you may find that there are even additional issues with other functions that we'll talk about later. Um, but those are just a few examples of what numbers you would have to exclude. Okay, let's start off with an example. Let's suppose we want to find the domain of a function. All right, I'm going to pick a function f of x equals 1 over the square root of x minus 1. Now you can take a look at this and think about what kind of issues may arise. Well, first of all, we see it's a fraction. It's a rational expression. Now you can't let the denominator equal 0. So first of all, one restriction that we have immediately here is that the square root of x minus 1 cannot equal 0. Now you can treat that as an equation. You can even treat that as oh, it equals 0 and solve for x. And for a basic example here, we could just square both sides and say, well, that means x minus 1 cannot equal 0. And adding 1 to both sides, you cannot let x equal to positive 1. All right. Now you also see that we have a, a radical, a square root. Regardless of the fact that it's in the denominator, it doesn't matter where it is. The stuff inside of a square root has to be greater than or equal to 0. So that's another restriction that we can also write. We've got the fact that x minus 1 has to be greater than or equal to 0. And you can treat that as an equation leading you to x greater than or equal to 1. Great. Now you put these two restrictions together. x cannot equal 1. x has to be greater than or equal to 1. And if you combine these two things together, it tells you that x has to be strictly greater than 1. Then that would be one way of expressing the domain of x. The domain of f of, sorry. And that would be one way of, and that would be one way of expressing the domain of f of x. x is greater than 1. Now, it may not be the preferred way of expressing the domain. So let's take a look at what this would be in a graphical format. Now the real numbers can be expressed as every single point along the real number line. So this number line here, this represents all of the potential values for x. However, we've just discovered that you can only allow x to be greater than 1. Now 1 is here somewhere along the number line. Now because we found that x can be only greater than 1, we can shade in all of the values on the real number line greater than 1. Now we have an issue here, 1 cannot be included. So we tend to show whether or not a specific number is included or not by using a form of a dot. We have a solid dot to include a specific value or we have an open dot if we do not wish to include that value. So in this case I have an open dot on the number 1 because x cannot equal 1 and then I've shaded everything to the right. And that forms a line segment. This line segment here starts at 1 and goes off to well, let's call it infinity. Those would almost be the endpoints of this number line. Those would be almost the endpoints of this line segment. It would be from 1 to infinity. Now, infinity is not a point, but it is a conceptual idea that this number line goes on forever, and our line segment goes from 1 until the end. So this is a line segment. And that will help us form the basis of interval notation.
Now, interval notation, we have line segments. And a line segment would have a start and an end. So we have endpoints of line segments. And these endpoints are included inside brackets or parentheses. And we have two different forms. We have square brackets. Square brackets include endpoints. Graphically, that corresponds to a filled in dot. And we also have round parentheses. And these would be to exclude the endpoints. And those we use open circles. Now, we always use round brackets for conceptually including infinity and negative infinity. Because those aren't really points at all. They're just a conceptual idea. We never actually reach infinity, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to make that a solid dot and call it as an inclusive point. So going back to this example, we have all of the real numbers greater than 1. You can see there's a single line segment that starts at 1 and goes off to infinity. So going back to this example here, we can actually say, well, this can be represented in interval notation as a round bracket around the 1 because it's not included going off to infinity which always has a round bracket because that's not included either. Great. Now we'll try one more example. Okay. In this example we've got a function s of t. Now I'm deliberately using t as the variable here instead of using x because x gets to be used a lot and I'm using s as the name of the function instead of f. But the concept is all the same. We're going to have to take a look at what values of t, in this case, would make this function undefined. And immediately you'll notice that we have the potential to divide by 0. Now if you stop and just think about what numbers you may not allow for t, you may come up with 1 or you may come up with more than 1. But Trying to just take a look and guess would take you a very long time for difficult functions. There's infinitely many numbers in the number line, so you can't necessarily use guessing as much of a technique. One technique that's going to be really useful here is if you see we have a quadratic in the denominator, then let's try to factor it. So let's take this function and factor it first. That won't change the domain s of t could be also represented as 1 over t times t minus 1. Okay, well, with this, you can see we've got our denominator factored, and that might make it a little easier to see what values would result in 0. So we could form an equation, t times t minus 1 is not equal to 0 if you'd rather, you could also just treat that as equal to zero and still be able to find out what values would cause it to equal zero. Now, this is called a zero product because we have a product of multiple things that has to equal or not equal to zero in this case. The only way that two things or more uh, factors can result in a product of zero is at least one factor must be zero. So we could take a look at one factor at a time, and we cannot let t, in this case, equal 0, and we can also not let the other factor, t minus 1, equal 0. And one of those is already solved. t cannot be equal to 0. The other one, we just add 1 to both sides, and t cannot equal positive 1. Great, we've got two values. Now, this is definitely one of those cases where this may not be the best way of representing the domain actually quite a mouthful. The domain consists of all real numbers excluding 0 and 1. And you could write that sentence out. You could try to write that sentence out using some notation. Or we can try to actually just show you graphically what that looks like and convert that to interval notation. So once again, we're going to take the number line. 
in this case, this is the number line for t, but it's still all real numbers. And we're excluding 0, and we're excluding 1. But everything else is still being included. So we'll keep an open dot on 0 and 1, but shade in the rest of the number line. Now, it looks like we've got three separate line segments. The first line segment would go backwards as far as the number line can go. Conceptually, that's negative infinity, which always has a round bracket. The line segment ends at 0, but doesn't include it, so that's a round bracket. The middle line segment goes between 0 and 1 and doesn't include either of them. And the last line segment, just like in the last example, 1 to infinity. Now, the other thing that's missing is some sort of form of notation to glue all these bits together. Now, in English, we could say that x can be any number in the first line segment, or the next one, or the next one. Now, we do have a mathematical symbol, just to put a symbol to the word or in this case, really, is that we're going to take this whole section from negative infinity to zero and say that it forms a union with the next line segment from zero to one, which also forms a union with the next line segment one to infinity. This cup here kind of looks like a U. It's convenient because it stands for union. Kind of means like an or. It means or essentially for sets of numbers, or just sets in general, as we'll find. This, you could just read this as t can be any number from negative infinity to 0, or any number from 0 to 1, or any number from 1 to infinity. All right, well, I hope that helps. That's a brief overview of domain and range and interval notation. Thanks for watching.